Hello all, and welcome to Essence of Wonder. This is our fourth episode, and we're very happy to have you here. My co-host today is Karen. Hello, Karen. How are you doing today joining me for this fine show? Doing great. Thanks, Scotty. How are you? I'm well. Thank you. Excited that we're at number four. And um, we have a few guests today. Our guest of the show is Malka Older, an author I appreciate personally, and I believe a lot of other people do as well. We have Tommy Coxon coming in. She has a, her own show called Tommy's Tastings, and she teaches people how to mix drinks. And today she's going to teach us something a little bit special. We'll ask Malka about that. And Stephen Lano, Yano, apologies, who is a professor of rhetoric, and he's going to talk to us about information. So with that, I would like to ask Malka to join us and say hello. And I, I will tell you as she's joining that she is so accomplished, I feel threatened as a human being. <laughs> Aside to being a pretty good author in my personal view and the view of the world, really, she is um, a in 2015 senior fellow for technology and risk for the Carnegie Council in International Affairs. Not only that, she won the Prometheus Award in 2018 for state tectonics, and she's alma mater for every university or higher degree she ever attended or went through with Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and so on and so forth. And more than that, she has an amazing book, specifically Infomocracy, which I would love to talk more to her about. And with that, I would like to say hello to Malka. Hello, Malka. Hello, Gadi. Thank you for having me on. And, and thank you for that lovely introduction. It's well, too kind. Absolutely. And Karen, you're with us, of course, and I appreciate you joining the interview. So on that note, Malka, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and your books and infodemocracy, please. Sure, thank you. Um, so I, uh, I'll, I'll do a reading in a few minutes from Infomocracy, which is the first book of my science fiction political thriller trilogy. The whole thing is called The Sentinel Cycle. Um, and these books take place about 60, 70 years in the future mm -hmm. in a world in which the nation state system has changed completely into a different political system. Um, which I call micro-democracy. And uh, these, uh, there are elections held every 10 years. Infomocracy takes place in the run-up to one of these global elections. And it's very much about um, how we can do democracy better. It's very much about the uses of information and how those affect power. Um, and also, you know, it's kind of a cyber punky thriller adventure election story. Fair enough. Um, I, I would say that sounds kind of current. When did you write that? <laughs> yes, I think it's I think it's kind of um, evergreen, to be honest, because, you know, if you look at if you go to Pompeii, they have uh, political slogans that were written on the walls in Pompeii and probably a lot of them weren't true. Um, so I think this question of information and politics is, is really um, it's always around. I, I started writing a, this book in 2012. And I know that that seems like it's before some of this has come up, but really that it was already going on then, you know, the elections, um, both in the US and which is where I'm from and in other places where I was living in those years um, were very much determined by who had information and who was able to, to sell their information. <clears throat> um, so it was, it was very much in my mind, but certainly it, it seems to be getting more and more and more <laughs> as we go. Fair enough. In that case, uh, thank you. And let's go to the reading. What are you going to read for us exactly? So I'll read a section from the first chapter of Infomocracy um, to give you an idea of, of the book and, and um, some of the, the characters. Sounds good. Wonderful. You don't vote? The girl's tone rises with the incredulity of someone who has sucked up every mag article and vidlet about this being the event of the decade, the election of the century, the most important vote yet, a chance to change the established order, blah, 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 blah. Her echo chamber of friends and rivals does not include non-voters. She's come to this supposed voter registration rally, not only because it's the best party on tonight in the greater Rio de la Plata area, but also because it feels like virtuous pleasure, an exciting civic duty with a built-in conversation starter. In sum, a semi-sentient being experiencing the first election she can vote in. Nah, Domain says, taking a toke. Why, do you? 
Girl laughs. Of course, I'm already registered. Why wouldn't you vote? I mean, in this election, we really have a chance to change things. Your vote could be the one to make the difference. How do you know whom I would vote for? Domain asks. Your vote and my vote might cancel each other out. She's still smiling, maybe because his voice has a way of making that sound like a sexy proposition, or maybe because of the alcohol and weed, the mild summer air of the dark night, and the sounds of the electric accordion from the stage. Somehow I don't think so, she giggles, which makes Domain want to gag, but he keeps his game face on. Anyway, the important thing is that you vote. It's all about participation. Yes, it's all about participation no matter who wins or loses, as long as everyone plays the game. Never mind that half of Buenos Aires belongs to liberty and is likely to continue to, and the other half has its head up its denialist ass and consistently votes itself into what's left of the European Union. All this surrounded by a checkerboard of populist and regionalist governments in the provinces, few of them with any sentinels outside the Southern Cone. How do you know whom to vote for, Domain asks. The girl's wearing an oil slick dress and it reflects the glow of the string of light bulbs swinging above the outdoor bar like fires on the water. That's what information is for, she says, giggling again, which is what Domain has been waiting for. Really, and where do you get your, an afro that big has got to say something about sexual potency. Domain snaps his head around, brushing the incipient ideologue with the edge of his dew to see an auburn haired Asian woman at his right elbow. Ms. Mishima, he growls, feeling his pulse rate climb. Mishima is also wearing black, but in the thinnest of airy cottons, flowing around her body in a way that probably obscures a few concealed weapons. Domain, imagine meeting you at this party. Domain is too busy imagining those weapons. He considers himself an eminently reconstructed male and is disturbed by how much those images arouse him. Would you be turned on if she held a knife to your throat, he asks himself. Probably, is the even more disturbing answer. Voter girl is still talking. Domain runs his right hand through his hair, giving it a subtle twitch by his ear. The magnet in his ring turns off his automatic translator, and her lunfardo patter goes back to being unintelligible. He needs his mojo back. Party, he repeats, leaning towards Mishima. Is that what this is? She smiles with dark crimson lips, looks around. Live music, decorative lights, various recreational drugs, nodding at the joint between Domain's fingers. Looks like a party to me. Ah, Domain takes a long pull from his blunt, as though he had forgotten it was there. I must have been misinformed. I thought it was a voter motivation drive. I suppose they might be multitasking, Mishima says. You looking to sign up? Baby, you can motivate me anytime, Domain rumbles. He pretends to think about it for a moment. I wouldn't have to actually vote though, would I? No domain, you don't have to do anything at all, Mishima says, turning away into the crowd. She's gotten word in her earpiece. They checked him out and found nothing in a long distance body scan or the records of his recent movements to suggest he's planning violence. Maybe it's her narrative disorder acting up again. But before she can take a step, a deep rushing noise builds over the notes of the alt tango. Mishima swings back around. Domain has turned too, although she doesn't realize it at first because his head is silhouetted in the glow of the huge flaming letters rising above the park, igniting one by one. WP equals dictador. Domain laughs with glee and spins back to Mishima, but she has already propelled past him in the direction of the fiery libel. Mishima activates her crowd cutter and it springs from its micro crimped home in the clasps on her dress a transparent vinyl shell shaped like a shark fin that lets her scythe through the mass of people glomming towards the sign. Jorge, she yells into her earpiece mic. Her vinyl wedge is pushing aside clingy couples, shoulder hugging friends, and as she gets closer to the building with the fire writing on top, a dense mass of open mouthed spectators. I'm on my way. Have whoever gets there first cover any rear exits. Everyone else, meet me on the roof. Mariana, prepare the rebuttal. She hates that word, rebuttal. If they had done their jobs right, the misinformation would never would have gotten out in the first place. It should be a projection the same size and position as those letters. Georgina, keep eyes on Domain, the guy I was talking to. He's connected with radical anti-election movements. She can't waste 
her any more breath on this. She's about to run up who knows how many flights of stairs. Just look him up and don't lose him. Another whoosh. Mishima glances over her shoulder long enough to see the flames shooting off another rooftop, but doesn't pause to decipher the words. Jorge, I'm on it. Her translator gives her the words in Japanese, but keeps Jorge's deep, calming tone. We've got plenty of people here. We're covered. Not covered enough, Mishima mutters. The Avenida del Libertador that runs between the park and the adjoining Forza Italia Sentinel has been closed off to ground vehicles for the rally, and Mishima skids across it without slowing. She's already pinpointed the apartment building, a pale facade, latticed, with minimal rectangular balconies, awnings fluttering over them in the faint breeze. She pulls the blueprints as she barrels into the lobby, projects them at eyeball level, and heads straight for the door marked emergency exit. The stairwell is cool after the heat of the crowds and lit only by an illuminated banister zigzagging up into the dimness. Mishima dumps her crowd cutter at the bottom. It won't refold and it doesn't provide much protection and starts up the first flight. WP stands for William Pressman, the nominal head of the heritage government. He's not a dictator, even though heritage has held the supermajority since the election system started. Every second as she pounds up and up, those letters are there, burning for all to see, being recorded and sent around the world. Even though the truth, or at least all the relevant information, is easily available, every second the words are up there sows more doubt and confusion. She can still hear the music from the rally. The alt tango has given way to a fast-paced Cora steel drum duet, which only ratchets up the tension. Why couldn't the organizers have stuck with some rousing but low-tempo trova? Breathing heavily but still moving fast, Mishima risks a glance out a window on what is either the fifth or the sixth floor. The fire phrase on the other building shines clearly now. H equals chai labor, a reference to a heritage sweatshop scandal from a couple years ago. Mostly false. That one is going to require a long and complicated rebuttal. Mishima pauses at the top of the stairwell to steady her breath and draw her stiletto. There is a steady thrumming from the other side, through which she can make out the occasional crackle of flame. She doubts she'll find anyone on the roof. Any half-decent plan would have the perpetrators far away by now. But the first rule of security is don't be stupid. Mishima pushes the roof access door open hard, keeping her body angled away, and checks the whole roof before settling down to examine the mechanism that's keeping those letters roaring two dozen feet above her head. It's a simple enough system. Letter-shaped frames around the wicks and a pump sending accelerant, kerosene from the smell of it, from a barrel next to the access door. Mishima wants to slash the line, but spilling flammable liquid all over this roof is not worth even a few seconds gain, so she settles for turning off the pump. The fire writing gutters and, letter by letter, blinks out, leaving the roof in retina-stinging darkness. Mishima darts back inside the stairwell to grab a fire extinguisher she saw a few floors down. By the time she gets back to the roof, the letters have blackened and shriveled and are sinking slowly down. She douses the wicks as they land. Two security officers from Jorge's team show up while she's doing so with their own portable extinguishers. As they finish spraying, the nitrogen haze around them turns ruddy and Mishima looks up to see the glow of a projection. Rubbing at the patina of sweat across her face, she walks to the parapet and twists around to see the rebuttal. Mariana followed the instructions. The letters look to be about the same size and she's even added a sort of shimmery cast that approximates fire. But they are utterly lacking in menace and go on for a paragraph and a half, stretching far along the avenida and referencing, as far as she can tell from this angle, the official Academia Española definition of dictador. She turns and looks out across the park in time to see the O and the R from the Chai Labor message wink out. A faint sigh comes up from the crowd. The excitement is over. The Cora and Steel Drum duo, Mishima can see the stage from here, launch into another piece, this one more of a ballad. The projection detailing the accusations and counter accusations related to the labor misconduct from two years ago appears at the other end of the park, but nobody is watching anymore. Jorge, Mishima mutters, did we get anyone? Negative. Georgina? That guy hasn't moved. He's standing right where you left him. Seemed to enjoy the show though. Domain has indeed enjoyed himself, alternating his gaze between the flaming subversion of information and the pantomime of excited consternation, urgent documentation, and rapid, vapid commentary in the faces around him. 
He stayed put in part out of hope that Mishima will come back to finish their conversation. And his eyes scan and rescan the laughing, talking, drinking, smoking, swaying Buenos Aires elite for her figure although he realizes it's a diminishing possibility. Finally, he swings around toward the group he was talking to when Mishima arrived. Voter girl gave up on him some time ago and has gone back to talking with her friends, glossy lips and unstopping motion, perfectly content to be part of this newsworthy, useless event. They're using you, Domain hisses, leaning in close to her, then sweeping his wide eyes around the circle of expertly made up faces. All of you. Thank you very much, Mocha. We appreciate the reading. And I have to admit, I really enjoyed your reading. Uh, maybe you. I'll even ask you about how to read better. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that Karen wants to start us off with a question. So Karen? Yeah, I, I really liked the, the voice. I'm, I'm reading Infomocracy right now, um, but I, I liked hearing it kind of um, verbally as, you know, just hearing, hearing the narration of it in your own words is, is a really cool uh, duality with also reading it. Um, I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned that you wrote this book over the course of four years. Um, I'm curious what that process was like, what the journey was like, and how what was going on in your life during those four years, you know, found its way into the story or, or influenced the process. Mm. Yeah, um, as, as I said, I started writing this book, I started putting, putting it down on paper, well, on the computer, um, in 2012. Uh, and... It had a lot to do with, as I said, the elections that I experienced recently, both in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, but I was also, at the time I, I started writing, um, I was mostly working, uh, I was working all over the world, but a lot of it was in Japan in the aftermath of the tsunami that happened there. And so the, the actual opening, I, this is from the first chapter, but this is the, the second scene where I started with the reading. The opening scene is this um, pachinko parlor that is called 21st Century. And that's a place <laughs> that I used to um, drive by uh, frequently on the way back and forth to the affected areas. And- um, Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it was, you know, it is, it, it was this place that was called 21st Century, but like already in 2012, looked in 2011, I guess when I first saw it, looked pretty run down. Um, and so it was, I, I just had this, this thought about how, you know, they must have made it as this really exciting name back whenever they named it, presumably in the 20th century. <laughs> and, um, and it got me really uh, into the mindset of thinking my way into the future and thinking about how, um, you know, things that we, our thoughts about the future often turn around or, and, and, and the things that we ex expect to be new and lasting often don't last. Um, and it also gave me kind of a mood for the beginning of the book because obviously working in a, in a post-disaster context was very much a mood. Um, and so the beginning of the book kind of has a lot of that, that feel to it. Um, and as I continued working on it, I worked on it kind of, you know, here and there as I was also working on other things. And I was, I was doing, doing quite a lot of work um, in various places around the world. Uh, and then I, um, I started a PhD, which was about disaster response. And so there's, there's some disaster response in the book. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's quite a lot of it that, that's really informed from the work I did uh, then and both the, the practical work and then the, the research. That's, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm really delighted by just the idea that this um, parlor is a real place you could go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's, not, it's not exactly easy to get to, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's there. As far as I know, I haven't seen it since 2015 was the last time I was up there. So. <laughs> I wonder how they feel about being, be, if, they, if they know of their fame. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I don't think they have any idea. It's, it's a pretty small Someday maybe. town. So someone would have to know and yeah, but uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that I really, um, w one of the ideas I like from the book um, is the, one of the characters, Mishimo, has what, what you call narrative disorder which mm -hmm. is a, a, di a disease that we would not diagnose today um, mm -hmm. and is sort of the, it, it sounds almost to me like the, calling it a diagnosis feels almost like a, a systematic gaslighting of sorts um, mm -hmm. because the, the disorder is a, you know, I, I'd actually love to hear you describe it in your words though. I can, I can take a shot at it, but um, sure. how it relates to 
you know, real life disaster disorders that we would diagnose? Um, sure. Um, so, so it's definitely something that I, I personally suffer from. <laughs> I could easily be diagnosed with this. Uh, and and I, I wrote it as a, yeah, in this future, it is a recognized disorder. It's, it's something that people diagnose and they, and they know about. And I kind of um, thought of that in a way that often, you know, the things that we decide to put names on or decide to collect in, as, as a constellation of, of, of symptoms or behaviors often really reflect the, the times that we're in and the things that we're concerned about. So, um, you know, I think that, that narrative disorder exists now, as I said, it exists for me, um, but it's something that in this future, you know, I think um, we're, we're so into content right now. You know, people are, are really consuming a lot of content in all different ways, whether it's written content from the library, whether it's Netflix, uh, whether it's um, uh, a, a podcast, whether it's, you know, uh, any kind of, of, of this different content, we're, we're really desperate for it. And um, so I, you know, I was kind of seeing that increase into the future and the, the way this, this syndrome works, this disorder works, is there are two main symptoms. One is this addiction to content, um, really fictional content, but it could be any kind of content um, that you just, you want more and more. I mean, honestly, we have so much content available to us. I have more books on my Kindle than, you know, I'm sure some of my great, great grandparents ever saw, right? It's, it's ridiculous. And yet we're always waiting. To delete my Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> we're always waiting for the new thing. You know, we always want something more. We always want something else. Um, we're waiting for our, our favorite author to finish the new one. And so, um, so that's, that's one thing, this addiction to content and this constant, you know, inhaling of content. And then there's something else that comes from that, which is that um, particularly if we're in a, you know, a fairly uniform culture, sociocultural sphere. We're going to be in, in that content. We're going to be getting a lot of the same narrative tropes over and over again. And this is not just fiction. I think that we in our, in our culture, we see narrative tropes in news feature stories, in regular news stories, in advertisements. I mean, if you think about what can be conveyed in a 15 second advertisement, it's not just that they're telling that much story, it's that we are primed to put together the pieces of those short images that they're showing us into a story that is recognizable to us. We know what they're trying to tell us. Um, and so that's the other part of narrative disorders, this kind of being very much attuned um, to narrative tropes, even in the real world, because we have just had them so much over and over. And by narrative tropes, you know, some of that is the obvious sort of plot tropes, but also I think things like pacing, um, things like the way we describe certain types of characters, you know, the physical assumptions that we make about certain types of characters, um, which are just pushed on and on by casting directors, right? Um, and and just, just all these sort of ideas about um, closure and, and, and different things. Um, and so for the character in the book particularly, this provides a kind of intuition but it's a dangerous one because very often in real life, things do not happen the way we expect them to from narrative tropes. But it can also be powerful and useful because if everyone is, is intaking those same tropes, a lot of people will act as if they believe the world is a story. And so there is a kind of prediction that's possible because so many people are acting on this collective kind of delusion. Um, so that's, that's what narrative disorder is. Um, Mishima has a particularly uh, acute um, version of it, which is why it affects her thinking sometimes, um, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. That's really interesting. Um, from a completely different perspective, I work a lot on aspects of so-called fake news, meaning disinformation, information, uh, influence and other things like that. And as you were speaking, I kind of, in my head, turned more to culture. Mm -hmm. Meaning I tried to analyze myself. And I tried to look around. There are things that are active, seeking us out. If we go back to Orwell, let's say, um, double think, newspeak, you know, people crafting messages for us to shift our opinions. But then that is kind of active. I think a lot of what you mentioned just now is more passive 
with overwhelming influence that's constant. And how do we filter that or just accept it or bring it into us without even knowing? But even more interesting than that for me was when you kind of brought it into what we expect of the world, I think. I don't want to speak for you. And thinking back to when I grew up on the internet, what I'm going to say would make me sound a little bit insane, which is okay. But I have two minds. I have two personalities. One of them is the personality I grew up with, um, with school, my parents, social influences. And another one is the one I grew up with online for specific communities that I was a part of. Uh, ethics that I learned there, different thinking, uh, thinking types that I learned there, um, expectations of the world. For example, when I drive, sometimes I would flash my lights. Do I mean for them to pass me or for them oh. to give me space? Changes between oh. countries, various cultures. And kind of bringing it back to what happens right now with me, I invented this thing called meme think. For example, I despise, I hate, wrong word, pineapple on pizza. I've never tried pineapple on, on pizza, but... <laughs> demand that I do. So I, I was kind of wondering, I was, I took it on a little bit to explain where I'm coming from, but I was wondering, what do you see as the most important or the most abhorrent or something that is um, something we should watch for today, in a way, and to connect it to a little bit of a different side, which one do you think is the most ominous for us as a society or the best for us as a society? Well, so you don't expect me to say pineapple and pizza is the most important thing, right? Because I'm not going to say it. How dare but, you? <laughs> I'm thinking about this right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, part of, part of it for me is that it's almost the, the collectivity of it that's the problem, more than one example. So for me, one of the things that gets to me quite a lot um, is some of the assumptions and tropes that you see in, let's take for an example, well, all of them get to me, but I can, I can really be upset right now about kids programming, right? In kids programming, you know, it's so often that there's these very, very gendered presentations. Um, you know, you have a bunch of animals, but only the like fluffy dog is the girl dog, as if there weren't girl bulldogs, right? Um, and the thing is, you know, if it were one show like that, it wouldn't be a big deal. But it's when it's all of the shows and commercials and books and everything else that kids see that it becomes really, really, really problematic. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's less about, I think there are pro very problematic tropes out there. And, you know, go watch the Feminist Frequency series uh, and you'll, you'll find out all about them. But, you know, I think for me, I'm, I'm someone who's, who's, you know, I, I think a lot of, what I've learned and a lot of what I, I value and my knowledge comes from having lived in a bunch of different places. And the importance of that for me is seeing that not all cultures are the same, that, not, that these tropes are not universal. And a lot of things that we assume are, are just inevitable and universal are not. Uh, and that becomes very, very hard to see when you get this sort of over and over of, of certain tropes and certain ideas that are just being put out there without being questioned. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think the problem is uh, homogeneity or, or collectivity of some of these, these ideas and tropes. Um, and, you know, I also think right now uh, for us, a big problem is the way they're being used in the news media particularly, because uh, you know, I, a lot of people have talked about the issues with both sideism and uh, the sort of idea that we can have neutral uh, news and that means they don't criticize anyone or they give everyone a, a chance to speak. Um, but I, I also see, you know, I see that playing out even in such details as, you know, headlines or sub headlines where they'll say, uh, such and such is happening, but is it really going to work? Or, you know, there's always like a but and a sort of twist around to say, we're not going to tell you the whole story now. And, and part of that is, is less to do with ideas of neutrality and more to do with clickbait, right? Um, but part of it is, is this idea that it's, it's a narrative shape that we need to give you a little in this way and a little in that way. And then you read the story and even for a hard news story now, um, a lot of times, you know, it'll be this, 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 and then at the bottom they find a way to have some kind of hook or turnaround. 
to make it feel different. Not because that's the news, but because they want, that's, that's their idea about the shape of closure for a story. And I think that's really problematic. And it contributes, you know, not only to confusing the various issues that they're talking about, um, but it, it also contributes to kind of distrust of, of journalism, I think, because of the way it's being presented very much, very much like a story. Interesting. Um, I, I, as you speak, I'm kind of wondering, it, it almost feels like what you're describing is sort of, I don't know how to pronounce that word, I apologize, simulcure of things as opposed to what things are. Mm, uh, simulacra, yep. And you, know, you want to say something? I'm sorry. Simulacra, yeah. Okay. Just helping you pronounce it. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. Finally, I pronounced something right. Um, except for pineapple and pizza, I'll never pronounce it. <laughs> but another, another issue here is that um, looking back, I think it was the 1800s that the rules of journalism came out. I forget the exact name right now. And negative sells, positive doesn't. Mm. And what I keep wondering is what kind of messaging that is so inherent you mentioned uh, growing up or raising kids with uh, modern day advertisements and i keep wondering what kind of inherent messages come into our minds as part of our culture as part of our being even without later influence just by being exposed to that for example a lot of uh, advertisement is around wholesome family values mm -hmm. and not necessarily family values that anybody in the political on the political spectrum would say are values but rather uh, what is being portrayed. Um, do you feel that builds up to that or do you feel it's more of a more tactical influence happening later on? I mean, I, I do think that I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of what is, is universal. You know, I think that a lot of these ideas, shapes, values have been built up over time. And, and sometimes, you know, I think that they're, they become kind of path dependent, like they're built up and then nobody goes back and questions even, even, you know, the sort of basic advertising thing of, is this the best way to sell my product? Um, because that's how you do advertisements about a certain thing. Um, and, you know, again, for me, that's often the problem. The problem is not questioning these things um, and not interrogating where they come from and not thinking about the kinds of thoughts and ideas that we're putting into our heads. And, and, and most particularly, you know, I think you, as you must know well, you know, the most dangerous kind of propaganda is the one that takes things on assumption. That doesn't tell you, believe this, but takes that this as an underlying principle and, and, and just assumes it in whatever story that it's telling. Um, and I think we've got an awful lot of those uh, in, in our society that, that tell us about um, the way things should be, the way we should want things to be, and it's very dangerous. I, I completely agree. And I, you know, you see a lot of um, folks who are doing sort of advocacy work who, when they will call out a particular, you know, piece of art or, or writing, um, a response they often get is, well, that wasn't even the point of the article or that wasn't the point of the book. You're commenting on a, a description of a character in, in the book. And it was like, well, you're implying this strong trope that isn't true. Um, and so it's, it's obviously very you know, difficult to to have that conversation for some folks where, where they think this is the backdrop of my world versus, and, and that is the whole world. Um, and the more widely traveled people are, but also the more, I guess, open-minded, um, the more you start to, to encounter evidence that the tropes you have grown up with are not accurate. Um, I grew up in a very small town and uh, I remember telling my my mom, I, mom, I don't think the whole world is like this. And her response was, who told you that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I pointed to the stack of books. <laughs> um, it, it is, it's, it's, and it's a very hard thing to shake. Um, I mean, I was writing about this and I talk about this and I still, you know, I, I, I have all these examples of, you know, when I was writing something and um, I was going to write, women and men instead of men and women. And I had that in my head, but I was just typing quickly and it came out men and women, for example. Yeah. Um, or I had, I was at an event once um, and uh, I said, my daughter was holding up my book and I said, this is my uh, intelligent assistant. And a friend of mine who I know is a very feminist person, you know, posted something about it and said, Malka Older and her beautiful assistant, because that's what we're so used to hearing. Um, 
I, when I was writing uh, this book, when I'm writing any book, particularly, I think for, it's particularly important actually for secondary characters or even, you know, the throwaway characters that you barely see. Anytime I felt myself writing those characters and they came out a certain, uh, whether it was gender, whether it was an ethnicity, whether it was uh, just something physical, I would immediately try to go back and switch it. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure, and that was not, you know, and, and, and again, people will often look at this and say, oh, well, you're being politically correct. But, you know, if I was writing about a security officer and my, my, my instinct was to make it a male, but I know from my, my work in NGOs that a lot of the security officers I knew were female. And yet that's not what comes out first. And so it's, it's that, that step back in questioning I think particularly, you know, writing is hard work and it's, it's so important to put, um, to put the thought into those, those secondary characters and those tertiary characters, because those are really the places where um, your world is, feels real or, or doesn't. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and there's, there's this temptation almost to think of main character privilege where the main characters get to be uh, iterated on and different, um, but the others have to be taken from this set of stock characters almost where, you know, there's, there's a lot of influence to the backdrop or from the backdrop. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I was one, one thing that I think of a lot of the folks where where I come from who don't share a lot of, you know, the, the ones the ones who said, where did you hear that um, and still have a lot of the same views is that they just are not for many reasons widely traveled. They have mm -hmm. not ever, you know, exited their their bubble and they're, they're not really able to, you know, they're not wealthy enough necessarily to travel widely. Um, as you know, as somebody you mentioned, you have a daughter, like, how are you? trying to you know bring some of those values to to her and expose her to more things and something just i personally don't you know really have an answer for but have thought about a lot is how to introduce other perspectives to to people where i i don't have as much control over them as as a child yeah it's it's really difficult um i i think it's you know you mentioned books books are kind of the thing <laughs> But it's, I mean, basically we have the opportunity with all the media that we have, whether it's books, whether it's radio, whether it's TV, especially the internet, we have the opportunity to look at perspectives that are different from our own. But we don't always take it because it's so much easier to just, you know, click on the friend of a friend and, uh, you know, just listen to the radio that it, uh, is songs that we already know and just you know, read the books that are in our language and haven't been translated um, that make sense to us. That, that are, and, and so you know, it's, it's a hard thing to make that initial step and probably the second step and the third step as well. Um, I think travel is great for it, but I mean, travel can also, uh, it, you know, it depends on the circumstances. It can be really hard living in another place and, and so much of it depends on the, the circumstances in which you're there. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think, um, you know, I try with kids, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm <laughs> really hate kids programming most of it. Uh, when I find good stuff, I try to focus on that. And same with kids books. It's, it's really hard to find stuff that is not um, along those lines, those same lines. And so I try to share the ones that I have found and ask other people. Um, I think, I do think that travel is really important, but I think, you know, we do have so many opportunities to connect and interact with people who are different from us, whether they are physically close to us or far away. And so, you know, talking to people who are, even if, even if they are close to us, but, you know, someone who's a different age, who's in, you know, does a different kind of work, um, and then building from there. I, I really do think, um, and it's something that I, I address in the book as well, actually, that the personal element is really important. Um, we'll, and personal does not necessarily mean in person. Uh, I think interacting with an individual on the internet is just as good, almost as good at least, as interacting with an individual in person. Um, but I think that we tend to trust too much to sort of mass media. And that is very hard to connect with, for that to connect with people who are already somewhat closed off. Um, so in the book, you know, a lot of the, one of the big themes of the book is there's this huge 
uh, infrastructure called Inform Information, which is an information management uh, organization, basically an international organization. And they, they really try to make all the information available to the world, to people, um, so that they can make uh, really good informed decisions about voting, but also about other things like consumption, purchases, you know, whatever they, they need. Um, and and it's, it's hard, people mostly don't, don't like them very much and don't care and don't pay attention. Um, and so they developed this thing called a special voter action tactics or something, I forget now what the acronym was for, team, um, which is to go out in small groups and actually talk to people one-on-one -on -one because that's the only way they found to get through to people who are already closed off um, to the idea of, of mass information. And, and I really think that that's, you know, it's so important for people to make the connection and feel like they're connecting with a human. And, um, you know, recognizing that humanity in someone is what will turn the person's idea of the, their stereotypes uh, around. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's that's really critical. Absolutely. Um, one of one of the most, um, in, in my opinion, beautiful people I know um, experiences prejudice very frequently, and the the most beautiful thing she ever said to me was, um, "My goal is only that before meeting me, people, somebody will think, I don't, you know, I don't like anybody like that, and after meeting me, they go, I don't like anybody like that, but she was very nice to me. She's a good one." The, so, so sort of thinking about the, the smaller changes, you know, and making, yeah. you know, cracking the door open for somebody uh, rather than kicking it open. Um, yeah, it's a first step. It's a first step. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, in, in terms of trying to, you know, many authors try to find the, the middle ground between the, the story that they want to tell and the message that they want to get across. Mm -hmm. uh, did you um, find any points while writing the story where you, you found those to be at odds or that you had to negotiate between them? It's, it's a really tricky one because if you're thinking too much about the message, you're probably going to have a crap story. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, what I do, I tried to write the kind of book that I would want to read um, and the kind of book that I would want to read. I, I, I really dislike um, reading books where I know what's going to happen. This is the narrative disorder thing again. Um, you know, for me, if it's playing too hard into those tropes, I, I just get bored. And so I, I really write very much as a pantser. I very much figure out what's going to happen as I go along. I don't you know, I tend to start with an image at the beginning and then usually some something from either the middle or the end. Um, and I just try to figure out how to get from one to the other. And that something isn't necessarily even a plot thing. It could be sort of a mood or a, you know, a minor throwaway thing. Um, and, and so I think it helps uh, that I don't know what's going to happen and that I make it up as I get to know the, the characters better and the setting better and also just, I don't know, I, I make stuff up <laughs> as I go along. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I also try not to, there are definitely a lot of messages in this book, but, and, and I think also that my personal politics come through very clearly in the book and I don't try to hide them particularly, but the book is uh, less about messages and more about let's take a, a, a setting, a change in the world and, and see what would happen. Because I, I wasn't trying to build a utopia. I wasn't trying to build a dystopia. I was trying to build something that would reflect in interesting ways on our own world and then play out the ways in which it would be both better and worse. Um, and to the extent that I, I did have a message, uh, I think it's less about specific politics, even though my politics are, as I said, quite visible. I didn't try to hide them but it's more about process, more about caring about politics and caring about the process um, that we go through uh, and, and the commitment to democratic process, the commitment to continuing to improve our governance and our processes. Um, so that was, that was my approach, <laughs> but it, it is a tricky one. No, I, I like that it's more, more in line with the cracking the door than kicking it open. I think it you know, makes maybe a less specific point, but a stronger one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, I, I really just wanted to get people thinking about the issues that I, I bring up in the book. Um, 
as opposed to necessarily. And, and in fact, the book has been embraced by some people whose politics are quite different from mine. Um, <laughs> and, and think of it as, as a useful tool for, for themselves, which is, I mean, I, as I said, I want people to think about it. So you can say you, you did not intend the book as propaganda. It's good, good, to, good to know. I didn't, but I also feel very strongly that we can't be completely neutral, which is why I didn't want to try to hide my own political um, preferences because, you know, I have some beliefs and I think that especially, you know, writing specifically about politics, uh, the, my beliefs certainly influence the way I think, think things will play out. Um, and I think, you know, there is no neutral. Mm -hmm. It's not just that it's impossible for us as humans to be neutral. There is no neutral. Um, and, to, and to pretend there is, is in fact embracing a kind of hegemony. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that's also a statement to say, this is, you know, you can figure out where I'm coming from from this, but there's still a bunch of ideas in there that, that may be useful to you, if, even if you're coming from somewhere else. Yeah, and I, I think I think it, your your voice gains authenticity from that. I think trying to to hide your thoughts uh, is probably somewhat obvious in writing, and, and rob, robs it a bit. Actually, I have a quick one here to ask. Do you find this is not just about uh, necessarily ideology or getting things th things across or changing people people's minds, but also about rhetoric? So forgive me for not remembering my exact American history or what I learned of American history. Forgive me. Um, but for example, I think it was Paul Revere who went around with the message about the British and the yeah. tea. Again, I might be mixing things. And uh, I heard once, uh, I, I don't think it was Steve, but we'll ask him about it later. Uh, a rhetor uh, rhetor rhetorician say um, that if he said, you know, the Brits are kind of okay. Whenever <laughs> sick they care of us, they bring us food. But the tea thing, you know, that, that's not working for us. Nobody would have gotten energized over it. You have to pick a more extreme stance in order to get your point across and cause action which I think kind of brought us to where we are today, which is not necessarily that good with the extreme stances. But did, did you take that into consideration? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, also about Paul Revere, I mean, like so many things, uh, it's not just what he did and, and people's memories of it. Now there's, there's an epic poem about it, you know, and that's, that's rhetoric, you know, and that's part of how people remember it. Is that exactly the way it was? Probably not. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. And, and absolutely, you know, a lot of the book talks about sort of uh, the way people talk on campaigns. And, and again, you have this, this big organization information, which is uh, trying to get information out to everybody, but it also polices information. And so they will annotate um, politician speech in the book, they'll footnote advertisements, they'll um, find outright lies and remove them from, from the record. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the book is, is looking at these questions of how, how we try to convince each other that our, our information is correct. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking about the way that group think, another term for it is community, and how not all of the, you know, not all of the effects of it are, are negative. Um, and just sort of, do, do you have any thoughts on how to sort of walk the, the fine line between, you know, keeping the parts that are, are good and, and strengthening and while, while sort of trying to avoid more negative effects? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. Um, and one of the things that the book is about is, you know, it's, it's set in this, in this world where you have a kind of, kind of micro polities and they can choose their own way. And a lot of them in the book are very culturally driven. Um, and they, they hearken back to nationalities or, or regional identities or linguistic identities or religious identities um, and then build their governments around those uh, so that the, the citizens, you know, feel like those are the places where they belong. Um, and, and it is this tension, you know, between, uh, I mean, on the one hand, I think that, you know, I'm a person who, who, as I said, I traveled a lot. I lived in a lot of different places and I was always fascinated um, by the different cultures. And, uh, you know, I don't want all of that to disappear and become homogenized. I don't think that, you know, removing community, removing difference is uh, an answer for anything. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, you have these questions of how people can see beyond those differences and, um, and recognize that, you know, humanity is, is not divided by those borders. 
so it's 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 very tricky. I think that we have gotten over the last few years a lot of practice in in <laughs> understanding and recognizing toxicity, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's honestly not that hard to to distinguish between um, healthy ways of people belonging to each other and feeling like they're part of a, a subgroup mm -hmm. and the ways that people tell stories about the outgroup that are not healthy um, or the ways people tell stories about the in-group that as being better than everything else um, than everyone else that are not healthy at all. Um, so, you know, it's, we, you know, we need to balance, we need to be inward looking, but also outward looking. Right. And like the, the idea that an out group or an out clan is useful to forming communities because it's defining, you know, mm -hmm. it, you define yourselves by these distinctions, yeah. but trying, trying not to, to weaponize that or, or cause too much. And actually, I, I think Karen, I, uh, we met a couple of years ago for a beer, Karen, and I shared the word for fake news slash disinformation slash influence operations with you that the academics use. And you loved it. And I want to share it with Malka. Do you remember which one it was? Well, I've now forgotten. So please share it with me again. Ah, <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing it again. Weaponized narrative. Oh, I did like that. And I do like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, narrative is something that just is very powerful for us as humans and, and can be used in a lot of different ways. Well, I, I think this is a good opportunity for us to ask you something interesting because up to <laughs> now, I'm kidding. I'm still upset about the pineapple and, and pineapple and pizza thing. I never tried it, just so you know. Mm. But um, humanitarian aid, mm. going all around the world, helping people, managing uh, in difficult situations. I don't really have a question. <laughs> I'm just, uh, how does that even happen? Um. Well, let me first, let me first uh, address the way you described it. I'll take that as the question, first of all, because I, I, I mean, I kind of feel like I don't want to make too much of a claim to helping people. I was trying to help people somewhat, sort of. Um, but also, you know, I, I feel, felt like in most of the situations I was in, I got much more out of the experience than the people I was supposedly helping. And even more than that, we can say, you know, most of the ways in which I was helping, I was using other people's money to help someone else. So I don't want to take too much credit for this, uh, but it was a job that I did for, for a number of years. Um, I worked in a lot of different sort of areas from development, which is, you know, when you go and you try to work on an economic program or a nutrition program or a disaster risk reduction program or disaster response. I also worked in, a, in several disaster responses, which is, you know, something much more urgent and um, immediate. And you're going in in response to a specific thing and, and trying to, to, um, to do whatever you can to reduce the impacts of it. Uh, and I, um, I actually was, was really interested in, in working in, in international development. And I, I kind of went and did a master's on economic development and international relations and the other things that would help me because I was, you know, this is, I, I wanted to travel and live in other places and, and I wanted to also be digging into a lot of the issues that I address in the book. So I, this seemed to me like a way that I could uh, learn this and also have a job, which was important since I had not, you know, published any of the books I wrote as a college student. Um, and I was, I was doing this, I sort of got a, an internship and then I was working for a, a, a local NGO at a very, very low salary um, uh, in Sri Lanka when the, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami hit the country. And so I was, I, I started working on that because that was what there was to do there um, at that time because it, you couldn't ignore it. It was such a huge thing. It was just, it was enormous. Um, and that led me to meeting a lot of people and it, it made me realize that disaster response was um, also a really useful and, and interesting area of work in addition to development. Uh, and I just, I kept working on it from there for, for a number of years um, in a lot of different contexts. And it was, you know, like I said, I, I really think I, I got much more out of it um, than I put in, although I tried to put in what I could because it was, uh, um, it was very, uh, 
uh, very intense. Um, and so I worked in a lot of different places. I worked in Darfur, I worked in Indonesia, I worked in Japan, as I mentioned before. Um, I did some, some global positions where I ended up traveling quite a lot to different places. Um, and, and yeah, you know, it was, it was really interesting. It's a, it's a very problematic industry. Um, along with there are a lot of really good people in it who, who work really hard. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems with colonialism. There's a lot of problems with, um, the way the industry is structured, uh, as with, you know, almost everything else, but. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, a lot of our conversation has been about the topic of information and how it can be used in different ways. And it strikes me that in the wake of a disaster, getting good information and how information, you know, propagates through, through those responses is not always simple. I mean, it, we see this at a global scale right now where the, the information isn't available fast enough to even begin to, to fact check different things. Um, do you, do you see that, you know, do you see some of the same dynamics that we've, we've talked about playing out even at that level? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, one of the inspirations for information in the book uh, came from a response I did. It was an earthquake response in, in Indonesia and um, the UN uh, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs had brought in a person, a staff person who is completely dedicated to information management. And I was so impressed by this because it was this guy who just stayed in a, a, an office and people would come and he would get information from them and he'd plot it on maps and he'd you know, calculate numbers and he would make spreadsheets and he'd give it to anyone who came. And removing that question of managing the flows of information from the people who were the ones actually competing for resources or competing for the information um, was, was incredible and made a big difference. Um, so that idea of sort of this, you know, again, not completely neutral because there's no completely neutral, but, but someone who is a little bit out of the fray, uh, focusing on information, just making sure it was available to everybody was, was really huge at that time. Um, and also you, you will see in the book too that, you know, one of the things that happens in disasters inevitably is communications go down. And so, um, the, there's, there's quite a few points in the book where people are very, very used to getting information in a certain way and communicating in a certain way, and that becomes impossible for a while. Mm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's critical to everything we do. Mm -hmm. um, there's one I want to throw in um, while we've got you. There's just a, a personal question I think about a lot, which is mm -hmm. in, it kind of go back, goes back to the, the topic of both, you know, minor characters, but also major characters in trying to create more representation in your work. Um, I, I always feel that there's some tension between not wanting to write characters who are in some way a minority that I am not, um, mm -hmm. or in, you know, worrying that I, you know, am I representing or appropriating? Mm -hmm. And have you, have you thought about this? Do you have any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, of course I have. Um, and it's a, it's a really good question and a really important one for us all to, to keep in mind. Um, I think, you know, and there's a lot of people out there who do really good work on this um, that, that are available for people. And I don't want to, um, you know, step on any of their toes. But I mean, for me, I think the basic, the most basic sort of tenet for this is that the character, even if it's a small character, right, is a person. And that that, mm -hmm. whatever the identity is, is not the only thing about that character, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so they have, you know, some... Uh, some character, some motivation, something about them that is not just that identity, whether it's ethnic or gender or, or, or ability or whatever it is. Um, and the, the other thing, I've, and this is maybe a different way of saying it, that people have, have seen said uh, that I think is useful is, um, you know, it's okay to tell stories with characters in them who are from a certain group. It's not as okay to tell the story of that group. Mm. And so that's the one where I think you really have to sort of check yourself and say, am I the one, you know, is there a reason for me to tell this story? Uh, and as opposed to, you know, just having a character who represents that group, you know, I mean, I think hopefully you would have, in, the, in this book, um, you know, in Infomocracy, I, they go to a lot of different places in the world and they meet a lot of people from different places. And I tried to, mostly be places where I had least visited and usually spent some time. 
um, so that I could have an idea of, you know, just have in my head some models for rhythms of the way that people would talk or, um, or different things that I, that I had noticed uh, among people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just, just trying to make them people. You know, I, I don't Good remember answer. exactly. Thank you. I don't remember exactly who uh, said it, but I'm going to attribute it um, with care to Brendan Sanderson. And I, I was looking for a way to think about writing the other. And I've heard a lot about it, read a lot about it, watched a lot about it. And still, people will not be happy with you. And I tried to find my own internal rule about how to go about it. And what was said is that some stories are just not yours to tell. Some stories, I mean, you can write about the other, you can incorporate the other, but there is a line where you are not the innovator because you're not them. Mm -hmm. That's my own yeah. word, not necessarily is. And I just thought I would mention that. Before we go though, unless you want to say something, of course, about that. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go though, I wanted, I, I appreciate you, we appreciate you. Karen has been reading your book this week and <laughs> I was just wondering what's next for you. You know, what we should be, should we be looking up out for? Um, that's a great question. I, um, so I had a, so the, the book Info, Infomocracy is the first of a trilogy, as I mentioned. So there's the rest of those. Um, I also had a, a collection of short stories and, and a few poems that came out in November, which is called uh, And Other Disasters. It's from Mason Jar Press and it's available in ebook and, and regular book. Um, I've also been doing a lot of writing of sort of op-eds uh, and, and similar pieces in the Times, um, the New York Times and Foreign Policy, uh, the New Humanitarian, the Nation. Um, so I've been doing a, more nonfiction writing actually recently. Um, I do have novels under, underway. Um, also, I should say too, I, I, have, I have a lot of, um, short stories that are available online. Uh, there's a short story specifically about narrative disorder called Narrative Disorder that's um, free online from Fireside Fiction and there's an essay that accompanies it too. Uh, and you can go to my webpage on WordPress uh, to find a list of all my publications and links. Um, a lot of them, as I said, are free, some are not, but um, you can get those there. And, uh, and yeah, I'm working on novels and Hopefully, <laughs> I will have more news on that soon, but I'm always writing novels. It's, I really am I'm much more into novels than, um, than short stories myself, personally. But I also don't, don't like to talk about them too much until they're done. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm excited to hear that there are some short stories I should go look for. Um, I actually am really drawn to short stories. Um, I will, I will be reading one later uh, in the show, but I, I like to just do little... It, I, I, I'm terribly behaved at cocktail parties. I'll, I'll grab someone, um, and if they'll if they'll sit still long enough, I'll just read them something I'm reading. Really? That's amazing. <laughs> so, go. Oh, sorry, Karen. Go ahead. So, thank you for saying that. I, I will absolutely look this up. Yeah, please do. There's quite there's quite a lot of them that are, that you can just click on the link and read, which is I think really nice. Yes. And that's actually extra nice. We appreciate you putting the content out there. Um, so before we go, I would like to ask Tammy Coxon, who is going to join us for our next show corner to come on uh, the show. And uh, I think that you asked her or talked to her about some specific drinks she's going to mix for us. I'm not really sure. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. So when my book came out, there was a, a website called, I think, um, I think it's called Criminal Minds. And they came up with cocktail recipes for my books, uh, mm -hmm. which is Awesome. I mean, when you're, when you're a debut author and someone has actually designed a drink for your book, that's pretty great. Um, so I was, I was really pleased. And I think Tammy's going to um, make some of those drinks for us, which is, which is wonderful. So enjoy the gin democracy, please. Th thank you very much. We appreciate your time and have a great continuation of your evening. It was great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this was so, so, such great answers, so informative. It was, it was lovely yeah. getting to talk to you. We really enjoyed this interview. Thank you.